and um, uh, you can basically extract rotational energy for from the black hole by by scattering waves as well. So this condensing this thing called rotational super radiance, hyperbolic regions, and with all these instabilities. And we talk a little bit more later about this. And there are other examples. Uh, there's this nice review by Cardoso, Berti, and Grito, and they just explain a bunch of them. But there is there are many many examples in field theory which you could consider as super radiant amplification or scattering. So this is a pretty universal phenomenon in field theory. So, oh, can, is there any way to because we have some tendencies behind me? Okay. It's okay, don't worry. It's okay, don't worry. It's okay. So the idea is, what are the general uh, characteristics of super radiance? How can we define it, right? Oh. Okay, so for, for us, at least, the key property that we observed in super radiance scattering is that it's always a scattering process. So when we want to talk about super radiance, we want to talk about super radiance scattering that happens in time independent backgrounds. This time independence is important because we want to distinguish it from other particle creation phenomena in which there is a time varying background and this is the source of the particle creation. This is the source of non conservation of energy, if you want. Uh, here, there is time independence and time independence, and then the energy would be provided by the scatterer. So we don't consider the back reaction, but that's the way. It would work. So we have scattering in a time independent background and we have amplification of the incoming waves. If we have these three things, then we say that we have super radiant scattering, right? So this is the definition that we gave. So this is. Okay. So to go in, uh, on this with a little bit more detail, consider just a scattering uh, by some field in which you have an ingoing uh, left moving mode towards the scatter, and then you have two possible outgoing modes okay, in the future. So the field in the past would be basically a wave packet, which is normalized. And then in the future, it would be a combination of two other wave packets, because there is uh, Time independence modes with different frequencies will not mix. Okay, so you can think of this as wave packets picked at the same frequency with the same spread. They are normally orthonormal basis of solutions of the field. And then if we have this in one mode, we will have this combination. This is a general scattering problem for uh, one mode going to the mode. So here we will have super radiance if one of these coefficients has amplitude larger than one, because that means that one of these waves at least is amplified. Both can also have amplitude larger than one, but at least one of them needs to have it to have super radiance. Okay. So yeah. Okay. So the question is what theories do admit this kind of scattering or admit super radiance? We can have insight from conserved quantities of the theory. Okay. So again, let's consider the same situation as before. And let's go to some particular examples of theories just to see how, how this works, right? So in drawing early like theory, we have a conserved quantity, which defines also a norm in solution space for the fields, which is of this form, and that is positive definite. Because it is conserved, you can compute it in the past and in the future. And if you compute it with a normalized wave packets or orthonormal uh, wave packets, then you get a one in the left, and then you get the absolute value of this guy plus the absolute value of this guy. Because the, 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 the norms of this guy are always positive because the, the basically the product defined by this is positive definitely. So positivity in this case implies that no super radiance occurs, right? So in this kind of theories, you can't have super radiance. If you go to plain order theory, the charge or the inner product, if you want, the conserved one has this kind of structure. This is not positive definite anymore. This is the field momenta and this is the field. And then if one computes it, the, the, the let's say the inner product of this particular kind of solution at early and late times, 
assuming that one of the wave packets at late times has a different relative sign to the other wave packets, then you will have this kind of uh, relation between the coefficients. That means that this guy has to be larger than one, right? What I have assumed here is that uh, the charge of the right moving mode, the out moving mode is the different, uh, the one that has the different relative sign. If you assume that's the left, then you will have a swap here, but the same conclusion applies. At least one of them has to be larger than one. That means that you have super rated. So the lack of positivity in the inner product, the existence of negative norm solution, that means that you can't have super rated. So you need to have this in theory. Now, an interesting, uh, maybe more technical thing is that you can link this to the structure, the invariant structure in the phase space of the theory, in the classical phase space. Why? Well, standard phase space is called bosonic phase space and it has an invariant symplectic structure. This kind of conserved quantity, you can define it from the symplectic structure, basically. And the symplectic structure, the conservation of this structure is what gives the conservation of the inner product. Because the symplectic structure is a two form, is not positive definite, you can have these negative norm solutions and you can have super radiance. There's another concept called fermionic phase space, which is basically a classical phase space where position and momentum variables are kind of Grassmann variables. They don't commute. And the invariant structure in this kind of phase space is a metric, not a symplectic structure. A metric is positive definite, so no uh, no negative norm solutions exist uh, in this theory. So basically, uh, in this kind of, of theories, in principle, you won't have super radians. This connects with the standard intuition that the poly principle is basically forbidding super radians to occur. Um, also, if you want, you can relate this again to the structure because the way you normally quantize canonically is you take the invariant structure of phase space and then you define commutators or anti-commutators with Poisson or several Poisson brackets depending on the theory, right? So this is just a technical remark. Now, let's characterize super radiant scattering in a general uh, process, right? So we will take linear dispersion here and then two modes per frequency. That means that we can have two input modes and then two output modes. The more general case, we will have this kind of uh, this kind of state in the beginning for the field, and then this kind of decomposition in the end. And both of them will be related by a linear matrix if the field is linear a bit. Um, and then, well, the coefficients of this matrix, but well, they will have a particular form. They have to satisfy some constraints for the evolution to be symplectic. A theorem is that this kind of scattering matrix is describing super radians if and only if it's unitary. Okay, it's pretty simple. You compute B, B dagger, and then you see that if it's unitary, then this kind of relation has to be satisfied. And then if it's non unitary, this can be satisfied. Okay. So there is a question now Is this a classical or a quantum process? We know that the spontaneous version of super radian exists, exists and it's predicted by Sandovic and Unruh in the 70s. But stimulated super radians, this idea of having a, an incoming wave that's amplified. It's always, as, as far as I know, seen as a classical amplification process. Does this make sense? Well, I would say let's be serious about this, as our former president was saying. So let's go to the quantum theory for super range. Let's say quantization of a klein gordon field. This thing here that you see has basically the same structure than the inner product in solution space. But now the field is an operator because it's a quantum field. So this is basically defining creation and elimination operator depending on the charge of the of the sign of the charge of this particular mode. Right. So this is basically a solution of the classical equation. So you associate creation operators to the solution. They span the full solution space, and then you define them like this. The signs, the, the signs here uh, related to that one is to have the, the standard canonical commutation relation. So you want the modulus here so that this is always giving you a one when they are the same mode and then zero other ones, right? Now, consider the general quantum scattering situation. Now, because we are in a quantum theory, we have to consider positive and negative norm uh, solutions. So the, let's say that the full solution space and the scattering is, uh, let's say, encoded in this four by four matrix, in this case, uh, relating the inner and out modes. If the theory is linear, the evolution is fully dictated by classical evolution, and all these co the coefficients of this matrix can be deduced from the coefficients of the classical scattering B matrix. 
for super radiant and non super radiant modes, the way you, con you construct the matrices is different because super radiant scattering is mixing different norms, non super radiant is not mixing different norms, and that means that you have to come to this or that case to, to you know, uh, know which one, which coefficients is relating the particular matrix element. So if you do the math, you get with this structure uh, for non super radiant scattering, and you get this structure for super radiant scattering. So the B theorem about super radiance or the characterization theorem generalizes to the quantum case also in a straightforward way. S is describing super radiance scattering if and only if it's non unitary Okay. Uh, let me tell you that S, because it's implementing evolution in, in phase space, if you want, it's an element of the symplectic group in any of the cases. So super radiance scattering is basically the non unitary the, there is a, the unitary subgroup you can basically see of it as a CC, that's a subgroup of the symplectic group. The super radiant scattering is outside of this subgroup. Okay. So, a little um, something technicality about the matrices. So, in a super radiant case, unitary, unitarity is implying that the total number of quanta is conserved. That means that you can, this kind of scattering can redistribute quanta between the modes but cannot create. And we can see this as a beam splitter kind of transformation. This is what in quantum optics that people call a beam splitter. Now, super radiant scattering, non unitarity, uh, means that this total number of quanta will not be conserved, but only the difference between two modes. So quanta can be created, but always in pairs. And this kind of matrix in quantum optics is known as a two mode squeezing transformation. Two mode squeezers generally produce entanglement and amplify. Okay? So, so some observables. So for vacuum input, we get basically uh, the modulus of the reflection coefficient squared with the setup that I was explaining before. Uh, as the well, this is the quanta created by super radiant production with a vacuum input. Now we can put classical coherent state inputs or one mode squeezed inputs, which is basically we take the two modes, two modes and then we squeeze one and then we leave the other in vacuum. Both states are not entangled. In the beginning, and in both states, you see that the production of quanta has well, basically the initial quanta, the ones produced by spontaneous effect, and then the ones produced by the stimulated effect, the super radiance. Right? Okay, so another more interesting observable would be the entanglement entropy for the outgoing modes. So we see that uh, there is non trivial entanglement entropy for the three states considered. Classical coherent states and vacuum have the same amount of entanglement. Entropy is a quantifier for pure states. So in this case, you can see this graph as amount of entanglement produced. We see that both vacuum and coherent produce the same amount. So the production for classical states, you can understand it as production from the spontaneous effect. But there is still production, which means that the process is not a, a classical process because it's producing entanglement, right? So we conclude that super radiant is an inherently quantum phenomenon. Whether it's stimulated or spontaneous, it's always a quantum phenomenon. And there is, uh, well, an extra, let's say, argument in, in favor of this, which is that if you input some state that is non-classical, like a squeeze state, even if the state is unentangled, the availability of this quantum resource, which is squeezing, amplifies the entanglement produced. So the entanglement is not always that of the spontaneous state, but it can also be enhanced by some quantum properties of the initial state, even if the initial state has zero entanglement. So we say that stimulated super radiance not only amplifies entanglement, uh, sorry, uh, the amplitude of the wave, also the entanglement can be amplified or produced or whatever you want to. Uh, <coughs> so let's, not, let's go now to rotational super radiance, uh, which is basically a particular example of super radiance that we've been dealing with. So. Rotational super radiance is always tied to echo regions, which are basically regions of space or of a material in which the particular perturbation that you are considering cannot be static. They have to be correlating with the space or with the fluid or whatever you are considering. And uh, when you have rotational super radiance, basically co-rotating waves, waves that rotate in the same direction than the medium, they can be amplified. Okay. Now, this kind of super radiance is tied to what's known as ergo region instability, which is basically an instability associated to the super radiant uh, production, which destabilizes isolated ergo region. Basically, you need some kind of absorption mechanism to, to stabilize it. So, 
We know Kerr like holds other regions, but they are stable because the horizon acts like a, an absorber. So anything on the rise of the horizon penetrates and then cannot go out. And then any kind of super radiant production will just remain here and cannot be feeding the Kerr region again. So stimulated accumulation of energy cannot happen. And then this cascading instability does not occur. However, what, what if we want to study rota uh, rotational super radiance in isolation? Well, you know, horizons produce radiation, so not only the gravitational ones, but also the analog horizons produce analog Hawking radiation, and that will be feeding the Elgo region, and we cannot study rotational super radiance in isolation from other quantum effects, right? There is this interesting interplay between Hawking effect and super radiance, but if we want to study super radiance in isolation, then we want to get rid of this. So how can we do it, right? The problem is that if we don't have a horizon, in principle, our region will be unstable, so we cannot form it and we cannot study. That is, we propose a mechanism that, as far as I know, I didn't know about it before, which is, at least in laboratory systems, we can consider horizon as configurations if the, the system is dissipative, if it has, basically, if the perturbations decay with some time, right? We have seen preliminary evidence of these stable horizon circle regions in dissipative quantum fluids of light. Let me explain how this goes a little bit. So you have here basically a rotating fluid, okay? And then the fluid rotates slowly in the outer part, and then the rotational velocity starts increasing. It can have a radial in falling velocity or not, depending on the case, right? So the idea is that when the total velocity rotational plus radial overcomes the speed of sound, the acoustic perturbations of pressure waves in the fluid, they cannot be static. They have to be correlating with the fluid. And when the, when the velocity of the fluid, the infalling velocity, overcomes the speed of sound, then there is a, like a trapping surface for the sound, and sound cannot go out. So this would be a horizon. Okay. So in the upper part of the plot, you can see simulations of a polarity of fluid with the exact uh, equation governing the system. And in the bottom part, you can see an experimental realization of it, which is preliminary, not very clean. Still, people are working on it. But it's kind of reproducing the numerical simulation. So in the simulation, we see a ring of fluid, a vanishing density part in the inner and the outer parts. And then this is the, this is the density of the fluid, and this is the phase. And you can count the rotational velocity. Basically, it's tied to the number of valid and peaks of this uh, Intensity plot. Okay, so here we plot the velocity uh, of the fluid and the sound speed. The green thing is basically the sound speed of the fluid, which is tied to the density, and you can see that basically it vanishes in the region where the density drops. The yellow curve is the radial velocity, so we can see that it's mostly compatible with zero uh, in the in the part where we have the fluid, and then the blue part is the uh, rotational velocity. So we see that here at this crossing point, we will have something like an elbow region, and then we don't have horizon because there is no radial velocity. This is the experimental realization, so it's a bit more messy. There is more oscillations. Maybe I couldn't claim that this part is completely compatible with, with zero radial velocity, but we see that the elbow region is happening here, and then uh, the density drops, so you cannot trust this part, right? So the experimental realization, this is basically the part with non vanishing density. Drop. And well, these simulations basically are simulations of a steady state of a polariton fluid, which means that, that uh, this has to be stable because there is no time evolution in the full equations. Okay, so this is basically an experimental preliminary evidence that these configurations do exist. Now, we wanted to predict or measure, so predict how much entanglement these kind of setups can generate. So we took a theoretical model with constant density and a simplified velocity profile, which is basically an approximation to a step function. The idea is to have homogeneous regions in the interior and exterior so that the fitting to the modes is easier. And then we have an interior region, which is the ergo region, and an exterior one. And uh, we can, well, the conserved quantity associated to the perturbations of this polariton fluid is given by this guy. You can see that this combination is basically the rotational velocity of the fluid in the inner part of the of the core, or sorry, of the of the rings. Then this is the angular uh, number of the mode, 
And if you remember in Kerala calls, this part would be what you call omega horizon. In this case, it's just the omega of the inner part of the ring. We have basically obtained the modes numerically for the systems and then the scattering matrix by just fitting uh, the, the coefficient with, with arbitrary amplitudes for ingoing and outgoing waves. And we have seen that there are non unitary scattering matrices, so we have super radiant scattering in this kind of configuration. So, entanglement production. Uh, this is the entanglement entropy for the four, four, four first uh, uh, L modes, so L equal to one, two, three, four. For L equal zero, you don't have anything because there is no super radiance for that mode. Uh, basically, this cannot be negative. So you see that there is no trivial entanglement production. The different frequency windows of the modes are related to the hydrodynamical approximation, which is basically considering low momentum modes, so that the fluid behaves like a relativistic uh scalar field and then there is also the thing that the system is finite size so we have basically a frequency window in which we can predict many so that was for vacuum input now here we focus for l equal one with a squeezed input we see that again initial squeezing enhances entanglement production which could be useful for for measure now we can see the effects of the temperature. Now the entropy is uh, not a quantifier anymore because the state is not pure. And we need to use another quantifier. We call it log net or logarithmic negativity. And this is, again, um, basically a measure of how much entanglement we have. So we can see that as we increase the temperature, the amount of entanglement decreases. There is even a, a point in which it can make me vanish. And you can actually predict the critical temperature for each mode at which you have vanishing entanglement production. This is basically the critical temperature for each of the modes. And you could check that the, these values at which the entanglement is vanishing are compatible with these plots, OK, for the L equal 1 uh, uh, case of the right-hand side. Now, if I have, how, how long do I have? OK, so I will have to skip this. Um, OK, well, let me just explain these plots. So these plots are basically the entanglement. Now I'm focusing on the Hawking effect for rotating black holes in real gravitational setups. There's a bunch of things I cannot explain, but this is basically the amount of entanglement produced by the Hawking effect between exterior and exterior modes. And here, between uh, Hawking modes and one of the two interior modes that you have, this entanglement is only predicted by realizing that super radiance generates entanglement during the Hawking effect because of the effect of the algorithm, right? For non super radiant black holes, entanglement between these two modes RC is exactly zero. So this would be another signature that you don't have when you don't have a rotation in the in the black holes. You can again see that it decreases with the temperature. Okay. So conclusions of the talk, super radiance is inherently quantum because it generates entanglement and amplifies it, even for classical inputs. Algorithm instability apparently can be quenched with dissipation, so there is no need for horizons, at least in systems in which you can have dissipation, maybe not so easy for fundamental fields, but in other setups you can. Isolated algorithms generate entanglement radiation, which super radiance does, which could be observable in, for example, dissipative quantum fluids of light, hopefully other platforms as well. Entanglement can be enhanced with squeezed inputs, degraded by temperature and also detection losses, even though I've not shown anything. And then rotational super radiance change entanglement structure of Hawking radiation with respect to non-rotating black hole. And this is something that maybe has to be accounted for in some scenarios. And then future prospects. So they are theoretical. Mm, we need a formal proof of recovery stability with dissipation. Uh, we need also necessary and sufficient condition for super radiance to occur from specific dynamics. So what, you know, there is a question of, I asked what theories can have super radiance, but I didn't tell you what theories will have super radiance from, let's say, the Lagrangian. Only if you compute the scattering matrix, I can tell you, right? So this could be an interesting question. Generalized methods to realistic polarizonic configurations. I showed a very simplified version with this step profile. This is not a realistic configuration but the computations are easier. The idea is let's just use experimental data or some modeling that's accurately similar and see how much entanglement is produced. Include radial velocity mm -hmm. in the theoretical setups and then mimic two-dimensional rotating black holes. So we can have this Hawking effect, super radiance, and the interplay. And characterize entanglement uh, from this two emission process 
in terms of experimental parameters of whatever analog system that we want to measure it, right? So we can optimize its detection. At an experimental level, there is experimental confirmation of the of the quenching of the origin instability by dissipation. We have preliminary evidence, but but they have not been able to measure the spectrum of the os oscillations yet in the fluid. So unless we don't see negative energy modes or negative normal modes inside of the algorithm, we cannot be sure that we are quenching the instability because maybe the instability is not there. You know, if the modes, if the negative norms modes are not, not available, you don't have super radiant. Measure entanglement uh, from a rotating polarity fluid or any kind of rotating configuration with super radiant. And then measure the Hawking effect with its entanglement in, in rotating black hole analogs, and then have an uh, experimental confirmation of this interplay between Hawking emission and super radiance that has been predicted uh, in rotating black holes. So, again, another funny sentence. Thank you for my presence. And thank you uh, for listening. Okay. Uh, is there any question? Thank you very much. Could you go back to the conclusions slide? Yeah, on this very last point, the entanglement structure of Hawking radiation. Yeah. Could you say a bit more about entanglement? Entanglement between what and what yeah. in the Hawking radiation. So in our in the Hawking effect, okay, you can have it summarized here. You have the two uh, transplantian modes typically. They merge in the horizon, they scatter in a particular way in which they produce quantum entanglement. This is the progenitor of the Hawking mode if you want, and this is the partner mode. And then you have the potential barrier at late times, so you can have CMB radiation, for example, coming in, and you can have scattering between these two guys here, right? If you have super radiance, this scatterer will be a beam splitter, as I was explaining before. So there is no entanglement production, there is no quantum production, only reshuffling of this guy and this guy. That means that this, uh, these two guys will not be entangled in this setup. So that corresponds basically to no entanglement between these two guys because this is a beam splitter. So there is only entanglement between partner and Hawking and also between part between partner and down, but not between down and Hawking. Okay. If this behaves as an amplifier or a two-mode squeezer, then it, it, it will also be generating entanglement between these two output products. So basically the Hawking mode and the mode that's going down from the scattering with the potential. This is not this is only happening when you have super radiance. So charged black holes will also see this, but not smashy. That's it. Well, I think we don't have more time for questions. So let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. So our next speaker is Álvaro Torres Caballeros from the uh, Instituto de la Estructura de la Materia in Madrid. He will be talking about uniqueness of the pop quantization of a massless scalar field in Kantos key such. Thank you. Um, before I start, I want to thank the organizers for having me. Uh, yeah, so like you say, I'm going to talk about today about the uniqueness of the pop quantization of a massless scalar field in the Kantoski Sachs background. This work has been in collaboration with Guillermo Mena, Jeronimo Cortez, Beatriz Elizaga, 
um, what's the other linear? So um, let me give you a little bit of motivation about this work. So when we first want to test a system, um, we have it's important to take into account if the system has uh, finitely many degrees of freedom or not, right? So if it has finitely many degrees of freedom, there's a theorem that guarantees that all possible ways to quantize our system is uh, our equivalent. So all representations to quantize our system are equivalent. And this is called the von, von, uh, strong Feynman theorem. However, when we move to the infinitely many degrees of freedom case, uh, things get more complicated. For instance, uh, when we go to the, uh, when, if we are in, in flat space, um, we use the symmetries, the spatial symmetries and time symmetries to determine a prior choice. However, if our system uh, lacks some symmetries, okay, uh, we have a serious ambiguity to deal with, right? Um, so um, what can we do? So there's been some proposals. Let me, OK. There's been uh, some criteria have been put forward over the years specifically for isotropic cosmologies. But um, so one of the criteria that I'm going to talk about today is one uh, proposed from my group of work which is based on the preservation of the spatial symmetries and, unitary quant and the position of unitary quantum dynamics. But given the right, uh, the grown interest in anisotropic cosmologies, we can ask ourselves if this, um, if this criteria can be extended to the anisotropic cases. And in fact, it has been proved in Yankee one cosmology that it can be extended to an anisotropic case. However, on the other hand, if um, given that there's been some work relating the interior uh, geometry of a non-rotating black hole with uh, the Kantowski Sachs geometry, it is interesting to ask ourselves if we can extend uh, this criterion to the Kantowski Sachs cosmology. So without further ado, we start by analyzing the classical scalar field of the Kantowski Sachs background. So we consider a massless scalar field minimally coupled to the to the background. So where the metric is defined by this uh, line element over here. So a squared is our lapse function, and p squared and q squared are the uh, two scaling factors. To avoid infrared complications, uh, we decide to compactify the radial component um, in the circle with period of two pi l naught where L0 is a fiducial length. After that, we can expand the solutions as usual in Fourier modes. So F and Y are Fourier modes uh, and <laughs> are an orthonormal Fourier uh, basis, which form a harmonic uh, oscillator uh, to the Laplace Beltrami operator, which is given by this equation over here. And the time component of the of the field is given by this equation over here, where this W and L is the eigenvalues of the Laplace Beltrami operator, uh, which is given by this equation over here. Right. So uh, we can, by spatial integration of the uh, Lagrangian density, we can uh, find the Lagrangian, and then by a legendary transform, we can find the Hamiltonian. Where this pi NLM is the uh, time component of the canonical conjugate momentum of phi. So, in order to apply our criteria, uh, we would like to decouple this eigenvalue from the metric functions p squared and q squared. So, what do we do? So, we need to introduce a canonical transformation. So, we start by setting aside the zero mode and define some sort of um, some sort of weight number that we call A, which is defined like this. And we introduce uh, some sort of unit vector component, which, called, which is called L hat, which is just the square root of L times L plus one divided by K. Then, uh, so the, the canonical transformation that we introduce is the new uh, field will be 
uh, basically uh, just a uh, rescaling of the um, of the original momentum by the square factor of this guy over here, which we call uh, B of hat. As you can see, given the anisotropic system, we are forced to introduce that this canonical transformation uh, must be uh, time dependent and mode dependent because P squared is dependent on time and L uh, is, is dependent on the mode. So the Hamiltonian over here, uh, this S L, uh, we call it the, the mass, the mass function, which is given by this equation. And furthermore, we can specify our lapse function to, to be P times Q squared, uh, and we call it the, the harmonic time. So given that we have already a uh, Hamiltonian, we can find the equation of motion. So the one parameter field equation for each mode is given by this equation over here, and we're gonna try to solve it asymptotically. So solving this equation asymptotically, we can always write the, equation, the solution as this, where these capital T, that's these phases, are determined by this equation over here. So we have our previous friend, TPL factor, uh, times K, plus subdominant times. So uh, using convenient uh, initial conditions, we can determine the form of, of this theta. And uh, so this theta, capital theta, will be k times uh, eta, where eta is the component time given by the integral of this real hat factor. And we can do the same uh, for the canonical conjugate momentum. So we can express it as this form over here. And we're going to find that its phases will be of the same form and the same order of, of theta. So now the dynamics can be written as a, a matrix form, um, where we call this matrix B. And this is the explicit, the explicit expression of that. Now we proceed to both quantize the system. So as I said, we're gonna preserve uh, the, the criterion is based on the preservation of the spatial symmetries. So we're gonna count for, it, uh, for one moment which uh, symmetries we have. So in the radial component, we have rotational symmetry and in the angular part, we have uh, spherical symmetry. So we can define a matrix function, a matrix representation which we call F, which can depend on the modes, but in order to respect the symmetries, it is important that this matrix doesn't mix any, any given mode. And moreover, this matrix over here should be the independent of M in order to respect the symmetries. Um, nevertheless, we're gonna let this matrix to be independent uh, of time. So we can introduce a time split um, between a part that is that's going to belong to the to the background and the other part that's going to be implemented unitarily. Um, finally, our canonical uh, conjugate relations is of of pi and pi or a and a data is going to be um, sorry it should be a a star here, but anyways, it's reflected on these relations over here about, uh, yeah, reflected on the functions F and G. Then the dynamics will be given by a uh, Boglyubov transformation, uh, which will be of this form. And then we can ask ourselves under which conditions can this transformation be implemented as a unitary quantum transformation? And the answer is that this matrix over here has to be Hilbert Smith. So in our case, we have to focus on the anti diagonal part of it. So this beta and beta star. And it's equivalent of saying that uh, the modal square of beta has to be square summable. Yeah. So in order to give a little bit of more detail about it, um, we can identify who these beta factors are and uh, using the canonical conjugate relations also uh, that was 
reflected on the f and g functions, we can determine the form of f and g functions, which will be of this form, where these bar theta functions are some dominant terms. And to conclude this part, let me introduce um, important that would be useful to uh, representation. Ah, sorry, uh, before I go on, uh, the beta square condition is reflected also, it's gonna be reflected on the bar theta functions. So these linear combinations times k uh, should be square summable. So the representation I wanted to introduce was the massless representation. So if we trace back to the, our original Hamiltonian and we said that our mass function to be zero, then we would have, have found that f and g um, should be of this form over here. So I'm going to denote this massless uh, representation with this funny tilde over here. And yeah, so what we have over is that we have already selected a family of, of solutions, a family of, of representations. Uh, and let me convince to you that if we consider two fog representations, they're going to be equivalent with one another. So we choose two different fog representations among this family that we have selected. And then without loss of generality, we're going to uh, choose one of them be the massless representation. So the two representations will be related by this matrix over here. And in order of, uh, for them to be equivalent, so we have already learned that we have to focus on this anti-diagonal part. Uh, so uh, identifying who these lambda functions are, we determine that these lambda functions are of this form over here. But if you remember that this, uh, these functions come from the same family. So we can use the expression of the masses of presentation and the acceptance behavior that we just used before. So the lambda square that will be no more than uh, the linear combination we have already talked about. And because of the hypothesis, uh, this is square sumo. So in conclusion, we, uh, by imposing invariance on their spatial symmetries and unitary implementability of the quantum dynamics of the klein quantum field, in a kantowski sachs geometry, we have selected a family of public representations that are all unitary equivalent. And therefore, in this sense, the quantum shape is unique. Um, thank you. Uh, is there any question? Thank you very much. Early on, you mentioned that you said the zero mode aside. Does it matter? Yeah, uh, it matters because uh, the canonical transformation that we're implemented is mode dependent, and because it's mode dependent, it's now local. So if we don't set aside the zero mode, uh, we have divergences in our system. Yes. So I was curious, how this would change the geometry interactions? Interactions? What do you mean about? Uh, the interactions of self interactions of the scalar field, for instance. Self interaction of the scalar field. Um, I think the system already has self interaction of the of the scalar field in the if we express it this. It's a free scalar. It's a free scalar field. Oh, you mean the interactions? In the okay, so the mass function won't be as simple as that. You will have like more contributions in in the yeah. So, but it's a curiosity. It's okay, it will break the uniqueness. I don't think I don't think so. But because it's only in quantum field theory, uh, you can prove the equivalence of all the quantizations only for the first case when you include interactions. I 
I also have one, one question. Okay. You, you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, no, I don't honestly know that that question. I'm gonna take a look afterwards and check that. Uh, uh, do you have any physical interpretation of the Hamiltonian for this kind of value states? Like it corresponds to some kind of minimum the Hamiltonian associated. No, for is no, no. Um, just for now, we have this a family of of backward, which is uh equivalent with one another, but. I mean, I think depending on the problem, you can determine a specific backward to, to work with, but there's no physical interpretation so far. Thank you. So if there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker again. Hi, my name is Uh Yes, hi. Can I start sharing? Yes. Okay. Hello. So, first, my name is Mark Liška. I'm a PhD student at the Charles University in Prague. And first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to give this talk. And I'm sorry I can't make it in person. So, the Title of the talk is Thermodynamics as a Tool for Quantum Gravitational Dynamics. And it's based on a long-term work we've been doing with my thesis supervisor, Anna Alonso Serrano from the von Humboldt University in Berlin, and with Luis Garay from the University of Complutense in Madrid. Now, the topic of the talk is uh, about how thermodynamics of local causal horizons can inform our understanding of gravity and especially of quantum gravitational dynamics. I will try to discuss this as non-technically as possible, so I hope that will be fine. And let me start by the basic setup. So to discuss the uh, effect of thermodynamics of space-time on gravity, the most important thing we need always is a notion of a locally constructed observer-dependent causal horizon that we can introduce uh, anywhere in the space-time. There are several ways to do this. My personal favorite are geodesic local causal diamonds. There is a small drawing of this diamond here, the idea is simple. You take any non-singular point in the space-time. The only thing you really have to do is do not hit the singularity, but otherwise it can be any point. At this point, you pick a unit time-like vector, which defines your local direction of time. Again, it can be any vector at this point. And in a direction, in all directions orthogonal to this vector, you set out geodesics of some parameter length L. Now, supposing that L is sufficiently small with respect to the uh, curvature length scale, uh, these geodesics will form a geodesic ball, three-dimensional here. And the region causally determined by, the, by this geodesic ball is our causal diamond. Uh, this object is very nice in the sense that it does possess a conformal killing vector. Uh, normal killing vector leaves metric invariant when you apply the lead derivative. A conformal killing vector just generates a conformal transformation of the metric. But uh, most of the properties are very similar and you can do almost everything you, want. you can do with killing vectors with the conformal killing ones. So in particular, for the conformal killing vector in the causal diamond, it uh, has uh, the nice property that the boundary of the diamond is a conformal killing horizon. The vector becomes null there. 
And as a result of this, we can very nicely talk about thermodynamics of these objects. First of all, it has been argued in different contexts and using different techniques that the temperature of such a diamond is proportional to one over pi times the length scale defining the diamond. And so in other words, if you are an observer inside this causal diamond, you will not see the standard Minkowski vacuum as empty, but you will see a thermal bath of particles of this temperature. Second, by applying any technique for calculating the entropy, either entanglement entropy methods like replicatory calculations or Euclidean path integral techniques or even Vold entropy and covariant phase space formalism, you will find that this diamond possesses entropy, which is proportional to the area of the horizon. And in fact, you can fix the proportionality constant so that it's just the well-known Bekenstein entropy area over four. Next, we can, of course, suppose that uh, this diamond, it's constructed in a general space-time. We use that, we make it small enough to see the space-time as approximately flat near it. But there are still matter fields present, of course. And uh, these matter fields will have some associated entropy naturally. And again, this entropy, you can define it different, in different but eventually equivalent ways, either using the von Neumann entropy formula for matter fields or using even the classical Clausius entropy defined just as a heat flux uh, over temperature. And in either case, the important thing is that the matter entropy will be proportional to time time component of the energy momentum tensor. So energy momentum tensor constructed with this time-like vector n mu in both indices. So we have uh, entropy of the horizon, which corresponds to Bekenstein entropy, same expression as for a black hole horizon. We have some matter entropy, and we can now imagine a small change of the causal diamond, either as a variation or we imagine a physical process idea with matter crossing the horizon of the causal diamond and the area of the horizon changing correspondingly. And since this diamond, it appears to be thermodynamically stable, we can assume it uh, to be in local, locally in thermodynamic equilibrium. Then for any small change of entropy, we get that it must cancel out. So we have some small change of the Bekenstein entropy and some small change of the matter entropy and together they must give us zero. Now for the matter entropy, we already have a nice expression in terms of energy momentum tensor. For Bekenstein entropy, we just have to compute a small change in the area of the horizon. And when you do that using Riemann normal coordinate expansion, most conveniently, you will find that this change in ARA is proportional to the Einstein tensor. And again, it's time-time component contracted with the time-like vector field N in both indices. So you put these two expression in the equilibrium condition, and you can note that in this point P, we can choose any time like vector n mu, it doesn't matter. We can construct any different causal diamonds and in, in every case, we will get the same equilibrium condition, which allows us, and this can be really done mathematically in detail, to remove these contractions with the time like vector field and write this as a tensorial equation related to the Einstein tensor and the energy momentum tensor. And this just corresponds to Einstein equations in the given point P. Lastly, ah. we can invoke, and this really must be an assumption of the model, the Einstein equivalence principle to say that the same equation, if it's valid in one point, can be valid, must be valid throughout the space-time. We can do the same construction in every space-time point, and because the local physics is Lorentz invariant, we will find the same answer everywhere. And then we recover the full Einstein equations. There are some technical caveats involved. The important one is that 
we only really recover nine out of 10 equations when we do this in detail. We get the traceless Einstein equations. This maybe is not so unnatural because uh, there is a well-known result that knowing the causal structure of a space-time only allows you to recover the space-time metric up to a conformal factor. And in this case, this is kind of what we do. We uh, get the Einstein equations from something that only really cares about the causal structure. These causal diamonds, they are conformally invariant. So we only can recover information up to an overall conformal factor, and this corresponds to getting the traces part of Einstein equations. Then, as a consequence, we only get the cosmological constant as an integration constant in the process of solving the equations of motion. There are some papers that have, stu that have studied this. Uh, the best ones are probably Jacobson's PRL paper from 2016 and the more or less recent one from Andy Svesko. All right, so we have this interesting relation between Einstein equations and thermodynamics of local causal dynamics. But so what? So what can we learn from it, if we take it seriously? Uh, one approach that has been taken by several authors is, okay, we have some quantum degrees of freedom that form up space-time. And when we take a thermodynamic limit for these quantum degrees of freedom, we naturally get gravity and Einstein equations as, a, as an emergent phenomenon. This is very interesting, but honestly, the procedure for deriving Einstein equations from thermodynamics does not really support this as the only option. One way to see this is that we needed to invoke the equivalence principle. We needed to start with some curved space-time background with matter fields in it. And this already put together doesn't give you that many options apart from Einstein equations. So it's really hard to argue that they, in some sense, emerge from some fundamental degrees of freedom. At least it's not the only option. And second, we can take a canonical quantization approach to quantum gravity, like loop quantum gravity, and then make uh, the entire way from loop quantum gravity, a canonical method, to the thermodynamics of space-time and to the correct equilibrium conditions for a causal diamond. This was shown by Goffredo Schirko and other people a few years ago. So, in total, we can definitely have a non-emergent scenario for gravity consistent with everything I said about thermodynamics of causal dynamics. Therefore, I choose to take a slightly weaker view at this correspondence between thermodynamics and gravitational dynamics, and that's that local equilibrium conditions simply encode the gravitational dynamics without saying which of these is more fundamental. But even this still allows us to learn something non-trivial. First of all, I've noted before that cosmological constant appears as an arbitrary integration constant on shell in this approach. And this, when you follow it through, does solve some problems related with the cosmological constant in general relativity. First of all, the vacuum energy does not gravitate in this theory in this theory and the equations we obtained, which takes away the apparently huge contribution to cosmological constant we would otherwise have. And moreover, the value of the cosmological constant, once you fix it at the tree level, is stable under radiative treatment, under higher order loop uh, contributions in effective field theory. So we just need to find the value of cosmological constant once, and then we are done. And maybe there is even a way to get some candidate for the, cosmo for the cosmological constant from thermodynamics, which is something that is to be explored in the future. So this is one side of things. We can learn stuff about cosmological constant just from having this idea that local equilibrium conditions apply to causal diamonds in cold gravitational dynamics. 
The second option we have, the one I want to focus on here, is that we can also learn something about low energy quantum gravitational effects from this paradigm. And to see this, we note that entropy of uh, any horizon, in particular the conform the killing horizon of the causal diamond, is corrected by quantum effects by a term logarithmic in the horizon area. Remarkably, this is a prediction on which almost any approach to quantum gravity seems to agree. You get a result like this in quantum gravity, you get it from string theory, from the ADS-CFT correspondence, even from generalized uncertainty principle phenomenology. And it's not just uh, quantum gravity as such, even when you do entanglement and entropy calculations for fields in vacuum at the causal diamond background, you will get logarithmic correction generically. And also if you just analyze uh, general statistical fluctuations or, of either the causal diamond or a black hole, it has been done in detail for black holes. So this form of entropy, ARA over four and some term proportional to the logarithm of ARA seems to be a very generic prediction. The only thing that differs in various theories is the value and sign of this proportionality constant C. It's usually a number at the order of unity, but for example, for loop quantum gravity, it seems to be minus three halves. For other approaches, it can even be positive. Anyway, we have a solid prediction for the entropy, which depends just on one unknown parameter. So let's say we take it and we put it into our local equilibrium condition for causal diamonds, like this. And in this case, we it's hard to do this analysis in full. There are many techno technical difficulties okay. involved. However, when you just focus on linearized gravitational dynamics, you will find a result that is equivalent to quadratic gravity. That is something we found together with Anna this year. And the other option we can do is to go to nonlinear regime. Naively, you would expect that you just get full nonlinear quadratic gravity, as that's what effective field theory of gravity would normally suggest. But it doesn't seem to be the case. Using some specific uh, simplifying assumptions, we got correction terms that are proportional to Ricci tensor square, like this. And also using different kind of assumptions in vacuum, Ted Jacobson, Jose Senovia, and Antoni Speranza got apparently correction terms that are proportional to Weil tensor squared. The problem is that either of these correction terms, they cannot appear in local diffeomorphism invariant theory of gravity that is fully metric. So unless there is some miracles calculations when you do the miracles cancellation, when you do the calculation in full, there must be something that uh, changes. One option is we really do break the form of physical invariance, and it's certainly possible. We do have sort of a preferred time direction when constructed the diamond that we have to get rid of, and it's very possible that that happens. Another option is maybe the theory is no longer, no longer local. The logarithmic correction to entropy, obviously that's a non-local thing. You have to first compute the ARA and then you introduce a function of it. So again, there is plausible evidence that locality might be broken. And the third option, the only one that allows us to keep both uh, locality and diffeomorphism invariance is that we introduce additional fields at the very minimum a scalar degree of freedom for gravity. And that again would make sense, at least operationally. And anyway, the full treatment is difficult because we would depend on how the horizon of the diamond deforms under small variations and it gets messy, but we think we can do that in the future. It's definitely our goal. All right, let me end with some take home message from all this. First of all, I hope I gave some arguments that local equilibrium conditions 
can serve as a useful guiding principle for studying both classical and quantum gravity. Importantly, this doesn't depend on any emergent gravity scenario. Just encoding the gravitational dynamics in thermodynamics is enough. We see that there are some new insights into the cosmological constant problems, which I haven't explained in details, but it can be found in our papers. And also that they allow us to probe the low energy quantum gravitational dynamics. And definitely there is a lot of work to be done in the future. Okay, that's all from me. Thank you very much for your attention. Is there any question here in, in the audience or is there in the chat? Questions in the chat? We are having some problems here with the screen, so okay. I don't know. Okay. 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 ¿Te sale o has podido sale la imagen o no? No, pero no va bien. Sí, Hacemos la última charla así, para luego ya lo iniciamos en la próxima. ¿Cómo es la última de los de la mañana? Yeah, I mean, it's a
para gestionar a la web así compartir no sí sí y ahora Okay. Sorry for the delay. Uh, now we have our last speaker of this morning season, which is Andres Minguez Sanchez. He will be talking about standard phase space quantization of a platform interior model in group So, thank you for the invitation. I am Andres Miguel Sánchez, and I have done this work in collaboration with Gabriel Felita Bana Vasquez and Guillermo Menamaru. So before delving into the main topic of this talk, I believe that providing a brief summary about the quantum gravity might be helpful for those who are unfamiliar with it. So LGD is a theory that tries to unify uh, quantum mechanics with general relativity, and with that, uh, it aims to have a better understanding of some physical scenarios, such as the early universe or the interior region of black holes, in which we expect that both theories have important contribution. To do it, LQG is based on a canonical quantization of general relativity with a diffeomorphism variant, non perturbative, and background independent formulations. In addition, due to the symmetries so of general relativity, uh, the phase space is constrained. Lastly, the fundamental functions that are crucial for the quantization program are the holonomies of an issue to connection and the fluxes of its inverse density strata. Moving into the methodology, I use the direct quantization program for constrained Hamiltonian systems. The starting from Hamiltonian formulation. <laughs> this program can be divided into the following steps. First, the construction of the kinetic Hilbert space, in which the constraints are not considered. Second, the promotion of the constraint to self chain operators. Third, the search of the physical states, which are the ones annihilated by the constraint action. Typically, these states do not belong to the kinetic Hilbert space because they are not normally safe. And the last step is to find an habitat for physical states, namely the physical silver space. To do it, I will consider the algebraic dual of a specific tense subset of the kinetic silver space equipped with an adequate inner normal. 
So with it in mind, the objective of this presentation are clear. Complete the quantization program for the interior region of an unrotating black hole using blockchain. The starting point is that the Carolmedo sync model that later on I will explain in detail. While similar works can be found in the literature for a consistent Hamiltonian formulation, they only reach the first points of the Dirac program. Moving into the Hamiltonian description for the interior of the black hole, it is well known that this region can be described by a Kantowski Satz geometry. In that sense, the interior can be decomposed into a foliation of a space-like hypersurface, in which it is light, is homogeneous, but anisotropic. Its topology is the real line times the true sphere. However, to avoid infrared divergences, it is convenient to substitute the real line by a fiducial finite line segment and work with a compactified version of it. <coughs> Uh, thanks to the symmetries of Kantowski Satz, uh, no, sorry, the phase space is completely determined by two canonical pairs, uh, PPB and CPC. Here, gamma is the Mitzi parameter, a constant that usually appears in loop quantum mechanics. To have a further picture of these variables, PB and PC determine the inverse density triad, which can be related with the metric of the special sections by a canonical transformation. In the same way, B and C determine the Aztec Arbarbero in such a connection, which can be related by the same canonical transformation with the conjugate momentum of the three metric. Thanks to the symmetries of Kantowski Satz, there is only one constraint left to impose, the Hamiltonian constraint. It has the following expression, where N is a Lagrange multiplier called Lapse function, and B is the volume of the spatial sector. The term OC defined here is a constant of motion that can be identified with the ADM mass of the black hole. LO is the length of the fiducial line segment introducing the compactification. Until this work, this space-time has not been satisfactory quantized. Moving into the first step of the Dirac program, for the Kantowski Satz, fluxes are determined by PJ, an allonomy element by these complex exponentials. Here, mu j takes real values, and j is a label that I use to refer to b or c. Allonomies constitute two copies of the algebra of almost periodic function. Considering fluxes and completing this algebra with a discrete inner product yields a Hilbert space. Before defining this Hilbert space, it is convenient to consider the following risk case. Here, delta j are two regularization parameters that later on will appear in the Hamiltonian. So I consider this rescaling in advance. With the rescaling, a kinetic Hilbert space can be uh, defined. In the trial representation, the action of the allonomy and flux operator, which is given here, and we can see that all of them are independent of the delta J parameter. If I now try to move on to the second step of the program, I encounter a big problem, and it is that the connection cannot be represented as an operator. To solve this, a regularization procedure needs to be carried out. It involves lengthy calculation, but in the end can be summarized into the following recipe. Substitute the connection with this other expression. Here, delta j are the regularization parameter and needs to be fixed. In the literature, there are many proposals, but for this work, I choose the proposal by Azteca, Olmedo, and Sink. The AOS model fixed delta j as function of the mass of the black hole. And due to that, it introduced quantum corrections to the black hole horizon and predicts upper bounds for the curvature invariant, which are nice properties. To maintain a consistent Hamiltonian formulation, an extended phase space needs to be considered. So in addition to the previous canonical pairs, two extra pairs are added. Here are the commutation relationships that they satisfy, and now the dynamics are generated by this extended Hamiltonian. The first term is the previous Hamiltonian with the regularization, and the two extra terms are composed by a Lagrange multiplier lambda and a constraint C, which relates the value of the regularization function with the prescription proposed by AOS. In a similar way, an extended kinetic Hilbert space can be constructed by taking 
the previous kinetic Hilbert space and tensor product with two copies of the Hilbert space of the square and chagallable functions in the real line for the organization parameters. A basis for this space is given below, where the um, geometrical labels are normalized to Kronecker delta and the organization parameters to Dirac delta. With the extended formulation, the Dirac program can proceed. For now on, I will restrict my analysis to the geometrical sector of the extended space. And in parallel with previous work in loop quantum gravity, I will change the density wave of the Hamiltonian to two, which means that the lapse function needs to be redefined as the following. With these considerations, the Hamiltonian constraint operator can be defined as the following. <coughs> and we can see that it is completely determined by omega j square and omega j operators. It's important to note that these operators only relate those values of mu j tilde, which are separated by a constant step distance. So in that sense, the Hamiltonian superselect sectors. The expression for this operator is given below. And the term OC with the globalization and B with as an operator, its taken states are going to be identified with the black hole mass. Some properties about these operators to have a better understanding of the Hamiltonian are the following. Omega J square is a four unit step difference operator, essentially self adjoint and positively defined. Its vector is positive, continuous, and non degenerate. Its action leaves invariant the following super selected Hilbert subspace. And its eigen equation is given below, where mj square are the eigenvalues, and the eigenstates can be computed by one initial data. Omega j is a two-unit step difference operator and essentially self-adjoint. Its spectrum is real, continuous, and non-degenerate. Its invariant Hilbert space are the following. And its eigen equation is given below, where mj are the eigenvalues, and again, the eigenstates can be determined by one initial data. It is also convenient to perform an asymptotic analysis when the absolute value of mu j tilde takes large values. It is also called will the width limit. In this scenario, the discretization of the superselected sectors becomes latently small, which means the following for the operator. Omega j becomes a second order differential operator with an unique limit. Sagan states are normalized to the direct delta. Omega j is not the square root of the previous operator, and in fact, it has two limits. Its Sagan states have a past oscillation in their phase. With this consideration, I can proceed to solve the Hamiltonian constraint, uh, taking into account the following. The angular dependence of the Hamiltonian lies within omega c, which is proportional to a Dirac observable and commutes with the Hamiltonian. And for the radial dependence, I can solve it by restricting the Hamiltonian to the radial sector and solving it in the dual space. Mathematically, this means the following. Here I have the Hamiltonian restricted to the radial sector, and here the equation that needs to be solved. Despite the notation, I recall that it is in the dual space. So the solution for the geometrical sector can be constructed by taking the tensor product of the angular contribution given here, that depends on one initial data times the radial contribution given here, which depends on two initial data. The expression for these states can be computed by, I decided not to include them in the presentation, because they are lengthy expression. To fix this initial data, a Willard de Willard analysis will be helpful. By normalization, the angular contribution can be fixed. However, for the radial contribution, I need an extra condition. In our work, we propose the following. Treating the previous equation, the classical one leads to a two root for omega b. But only one of them has a good behavior in the classical limit when um, the realization parameter delta b tends to zero. So we impose the following condition for the first point of the superselected sector that help us to fix the two initial data for the radial contribution. 
To complete the physical states, I need to present the constraints that relate the regularization parameter with the prescription proposed by AOS. So the only restriction that AOS imposed is that when the mass of the black hole is large, this function k tilde j must behave as the following, where capital delta is the area gap in loop quantum gravity. And with that, the physical states can be computed. They have the following expression, and they are characterized by a wave function of the black hole. Its habitat is the algebraic dual of the set of eigenstates of PB and PC tilde, as well as, algebraic, as well as the algebraic dual of the eigenspace of delta B and delta C. To complete the program, I need to define a physical Hilbert space. As I anticipated, the previous states are divergent in the extended kinetic Hilbert space. So the first thing that I can do is restrict the norm to the geometrical sector of the extended space. However, thanks to the wheeler dewitt analysis, we know that there is still an asymptotic, sorry, a divergent part in the norm that is of this form. So for the case in which the absolute value Kb tilde has an upper bound, which we call P, the following physical inner product provides a physical Hilbert space for the system which is given here. Lastly, an observable for this Hitler space will be the mass of the black hole. And the conclusions. With our representation of the standard kinetic Hilbert space, the Hamiltonian constraint operator in the geometric sector becomes uncoupled for the organization parameters. Our proposal to solve the Hamiltonian constraint operator allow for the construction of solution from the value of the black hole mass. The quantization program for the US model is complete. And this works with the way for future projects that may include perturbation and the inclusion of matter in the model. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. Could you elaborate on this uh, notion of any value of the black hole mass in your second paragraph there? D does it make sense to ask, is the mass spectrum discrete or continuous? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So in our work, we were defining that the spectrum mass of the black hole must be continuous to have a better transition between the semi-classical limit with the quantum behavior. However, other works advocate for a discrete spectrum. So the, the sentence means that if we consider a, a continuous black hole, a continuous um, spectrum for the black hole mass, the, we maintain all the values for the mass of the black hole. So could you have a, a physical state in which the uh, mass of the black hole has an exact single value? Uh, I mean, if the, if the wave function of the black hole mass is a direct delta, I think that maybe yes, but I'm not sure. Any other questions? If not, let's call the sign the speaker again. Well, the speaker of this morning session, so we're going for lunch. Yeah. We see here at um, the bridge. Half past three. Okay. So lunch, it lasts for about uh, one hour and 40 minutes. Okay. And we need we need here again. Okay.
Ah, okay. Vamos, que tú sabes, que va a So that's why uh, when you try to study unitary por eso lo que no Yeah. 
Well, it's nice, nice to see you. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, I didn't know we had a previous. I wasn't sure. Before this comes from 